It's hard to believe that Marilyn Manson and Trent Reznor had a decades-long feud, considering how they used to work together and shared some similar traits. Today, let's explore the feud between both musicians. Trent Reznor had an early aptitude for music, playing piano at the age of 12, with his grandfather telling People magazine in 1995, Reznor was a good kid, a boy scout who loved to skateboard, build model planes, and play the piano. Music was his life, from the time he was a wee boy, he was so gifted, he would say. Growing up in Pennsylvania, Reznor found excitement through music, horror movies, and television shows to escape the boredom of small town life. It would be music that allowed him to reinvent himself later in his life. He would play jazz, he was in the marching band, and was part of the drama club in high school, playing Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar. The strange coincidence that he'd later work with Marilyn Manson on his album Antichrist Superstar years later. Reznor would end up moving to Cleveland, Ohio in 1985 when he was just 23 years old and worked as a janitor and assistant engineer in a local studio. During his off days, he was allowed to record material in the studio, and that would result in Nine Inch Nails' debut record, 1989's Pretty Hate Machine. The album was a huge success going gold, despite the fact it was released on an indie label. Reznor's follow-up, 1992's EP Broken, went into a heavier direction, and it resulted in a prolonged legal battle with his label TVT Records over creative control over Nine Inch Nails' sound. Reznor eventually would sign with major label Interscope. Trent Reznor would end up meeting a young Marilyn Manson around 1989 when Manson interviewed the Nine Inch Nails frontman while he worked as a journalist for a South Florida publication called The 25th Parallel. They would meet at a club in Florida, and according to Manson's biography, Reznor wasn't very friendly initially as he was moping in the corner, but as they started to chat, things seemed to warm up. Manson would tell Guitar World in 1992, Trent and I met around the same time that Marilyn Manson was formed. We became friends. We had a lot in common, he'd say. By the early 90s, they would meet again when Manson's band The Spooky Kids were opening for Nine Inch Nails at a club in Florida. Manson, by his own admission, was tripping on acid and went to Reznor to ask him for feedback on the band's performance. Reznor, for his part, hadn't watched the show, but took a tape from Manson. Reznor and Manson would end up collaborating on the video for the song Gave Up from Nine Inch Nails' EP Broken. There would be three different versions of the video for the song, with one version featuring footage of Manson recording the track with the band. It was around this time that Reznor formed his own label Nothing Records under Interscope, and it wasn't too long after that that Manson would end up hearing from Reznor's manager, asking for him to send more material his way. Manson would be the first artist Reznor would sign to his new imprint, and by this point in time, Reznor was working on Nine Inch Nails' second LP, The Downward Spiral, at 1005 Cielo Drive. It was the same address that actress Sharon Tate was murdered in by the followers of cult leader Charles Manson. Marilyn Manson soon started work on his first album for Nothing Records, initially titled The Manson Family Album. Originally linked to the project would be producer Roly Massiman, who had worked with The Swans. But after several months in the studio, over the summer of 1993, Manson wasn't happy with the results. He felt that the recordings were too polished and didn't capture the live energy of the band. By October of 1993, Reznor stepped in the producer's chair and brought in some of his session players from Nine Inch Nails to finish up recording over a two-month period, with Manson telling the Miami New Times, We spent seven weeks redoing, fixing, sometimes starting from scratch. That was our band's first experience in a real studio on a project this big. We didn't know what to expect. It was 14 hour days with the team, Trent, Alan Mulder, Sean Bevan and me bringing out the sound he'd say. When the album was submitted to Interscope to release in early 1994, the label initially rejected the record, citing concerns over references to Charles Manson. It had turned out around this time that Interscope's parent company, Universal Music, was dealing with the backlash that Guns N' Roses had initiated when they recorded a cover of the Charles Manson song, Look At Your Game Girl, as a hidden track on their 1993 album, The Spaghetti Incident, a few months earlier. Side note guys, I've done a whole video on that controversy, the link is down below. The name of the album was changed to Portrait of an American Family. Satisfied, Interscope put out the album, but it was a slow burn taking almost a year to catch on. The album's success was spurred by Manson's 1995 EP Smells Like Children, which produced a monster hit with the group's cover of the Eurythmics song Sweet Dreams. Manson would admit in his book that he butted heads with Nothing Records over what song to release as a single. The label instead wanted to put out his cover of Screaming Jay Hawkins' song I Put a Spell on You. Sweet Dreams was Manson's first big hit on MTV and introduced a lot of people to a shock rocker persona. 
The following year, Manson began work on the group's second LP, Antichrist Superstar. Up until this point, Reznor had produced all of the band's releases, something which didn't change with their next album. Manson would recall to Rolling Stone how one of his dreams served as an inspiration for the album, saying, I started having dreams and visions of the world being destroyed and me being the only one left. It was like an ultimate retribution for all the things that have happened to me growing up. One dream took place sometime in the future. It may have been in Fort Lauderdale. Entertainment had gone to such an extreme that they had taken people and made them into zombies, almost just for entertainment's sake, he'd say. Antichrist Superstar would be recorded over an eight-month period, and it was a tumultuous time for the group. The band's behavior in the studio was destructive, resulting in damage to both the building in addition to the band's equipment. During the recording of the album, guitarist Daisy Berkowitz left the group after having much of his equipment destroyed by both the band and Reznor. Twiggy Ramirez would end up playing a majority of the guitar tracks on the album, and the record also resulted in a lot of creative tension between Reznor and Manson. Manson would claim that Reznor was responsible for starting the feud in the studio, telling Howard Stern, Trent came to me and said we need to stop doing drugs. The very next day I stopped doing drugs, then things changed and I was the nerd. Reznor, according to Manson, didn't clean up, and soon enough Twiggy Ramirez and Reznor were making fun of Manson, calling him and I quote, Arch Deluxe. Arch Deluxe was a reference to a hamburger that McDonald's was marketing at the time, exclusively to adults. Following a fight between Reznor and Manson in the studio, the producer kicked the frontman out, only to take a hammer and destroy the hard drive that contained what many thought were the masters for the album. In the years that followed, Manson thought that the masters were lost, but it would turn out they were never on the hard drive that Reznor smashed. Antichrist Superstar would be the album that made Manson a household name, a staple of MTV, and filled religious conservatives with fear. Madsen would take on a larger-than-life persona with the media and religious organizations, making him public enemy number one, and recreated the fear of the satanic panic. His concerts would be picketed, he would be barred from playing state-run venues, and became the scapegoat for many of the problems America's youth were facing. Some states, including South Carolina, offered Manson money not to play their state, and schools in Florida went as far as threatening to expel students who attended his concerts. The following year, in 1997, the David Lynch film Lost Highway would feature musical contributions from both Manson and Reznor, who were still wrapping up Antichrist Superstar. The project supposedly took Reznor off of Manson's album for a little while, and it only added to their strained relationship. Manson would also make a cameo in the film with Twiggy Ramirez, it was initially reported that Lynch asked Manson to score the soundtrack, but the job eventually went to Reznor. Manson would end up leaving Nothing Records shortly afterwards. The following year, Reznor would be interviewed by Spin Magazine, where the publication wrote the following. Unlike many musicians, Reznor is savagely aware of his place in the current strata of pop stars. He constantly compares himself to other musicians, saying that he can't write a thousand songs like Billy Corgan, that he's not as careerist as Marilyn Manson. Reznor would end up returning to Nine Inch Nails in 1999 to put out the group's third LP, The Fragile. Featured on the album would be a song called Star Effers Incorporated, or as MTV put it, Star Suckers, which some interpreted as a shot at both Courtney Love and Marilyn Manson. The irony of the diss track was that it spelled the first sign of reconciliation between Reznor and Manson. Manson would end up appearing in and co-directing the music video for the song. He would also make a surprise appearance in Nine Inch Nails concert on May 9th, 2000 at Madison Square Garden in New York City to perform the track. The concert also saw Manson perform his own song, Beautiful People, with Nine Inch Nails. Here's MTV covering the reunion and interviewing both musicians. We shouldn't be competing. There's much more terrible music out there that we should unite against. You remember a phase where every time you open up Rolling Stone, there's a picture of Michael Stipe popping out of somebody's underpants. And then it was Billy Corgan everywhere, everywhere. We didn't want to make a video that seemed like we're bitchy because uh, Limp Bizkit's doing better than we are in their minds. So look, I'm not going to say Limp Bizkit sucks, you know? You know it, I know it, but I'm not going to say it. It was around this time that Reznor would speak to Krang Magazine, where he also confirmed that himself and Madsen shared a mutual hatred of Courtney Love, while also reflecting on his new relationship with Manson, saying, It felt really good to see the guy again and hang out. I reluctantly missed him. We were like brothers, and I couldn't even tell you why we fell out. It was something to do with him getting some fame and both of us being out of our minds. Side note, guys, I've done a whole video on the Courtney Love and Marilyn Manson tour from the late 90s. The link is down below. The reconciliation would be short-lived, as Manson and Reznor went back to sniping at each other in the press. The source of the escalating tension was said to be the masters from Manson's first several albums 
that he wanted access to as he contemplated putting out reissues. Manson would tell an interviewer when asked about reissuing his first three albums, I'd like to say yes, but there's a legal matter pending that I can't say too much about. It's very hard to believe this, but representatives from Nothing Records have indicated that they are not able to find or have lost the master recordings to my first three records. It's not something you would ever let happen in musical history. I would imagine something like that could only be intentional. If not intentional, it would have to be done only through complete disregard. Now that Nothing Records doesn't exist, I think there's only one or two people responsible for that. Out of those two people, there's only one that really has an opinion of me that is voiced very often, he'd say. This coupled with the fact that Reznor got sober in 2001 led to the Nine Inch Nails frontman keeping a distance between himself and Manson. Reznor would claim to outlet WENN, I'm not blameless for sure, but part of it is that we were friends, I was helping him out, then he's on my label, then he's opening for my band, and the competitive nature of it got to him. I'm disappointed, but you lose friends along the way. There's a toxic element to him that probably wouldn't be healthy for me to be around, he would say. In 2004, Reznor took another shot at Manson during an online chat with fans. One fan would ask Reznor if he was planning on covering any songs in the future, to which he responded, I was hoping to do something unique and pertinent, like do an exact cover or replica of the song Personal Jesus, but it was already taken. This comment was meant to be a shot at Madsen's cover of the Depeche Mode track. Fast forward to 2009, Reznor would give an interview to Mojo Magazine, again blasting Madsen, saying he's a malicious guy and will step on anybody's face to succeed and cross any line of decency. Seeing him now, drugs and alcohol now rule his life, and he's become a dopey clown. Several years later, in 2011, Reznor was asked whether he'd work with Manson again, responding that Manson is, and I quote, a talented person, and that we've had our problems, but I wear suits, I'm an adult now. The following year, Manson was interviewed by Arizona Central, where he discussed their relationship, saying, I don't have any bad feelings towards him, I really don't. He helped put me into this world, and I went my way, and whatever happened, happened. I don't think you should go back and fix things that have already been done anyway. I don't think there is tension. I don't think we ever really had a lot in common. We had a certain sense of humor in common. He was always more of a jock and I was more of a burnout, he'd say. Then in 2015, Reznor would talk to Rolling Stone where the topic of Manson came up again, saying, I mean, I really haven't thought much about the guy. I wish him the best and we were good friends at one point in the past and we became not such good friends. People change and I don't go around carrying it on my shoulders at all. So I've said many, many stupid things in my career. That wasn't as bad as some, so I'm glad that you focused on that one. Notice I didn't deny saying that, or my feelings didn't change, he'd say. In 2017, Madsen confirmed to radio host Howard Stern that the beef was water under the bridge, and that he was now open to collaborating with Reznor. He would reveal that Reznor still had the masters to Antichrist Superstar, and the reunion was initiated when Madsen was watching the documentary The Defiant Ones about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. That documentary also featured an interview with Reznor, and Manson would admit that it made him nostalgic for their friendship. It was around this time that Manson and Reznor appeared to start talking again, with Manson telling interviewer Zane Lowe, he's the one who actually sent me an email. We had sort of mended ways after a long time through Tyler Bates, strangely enough. He goes and he said in the email something along the lines of, it really pisses me off that music's not dangerous anymore, and it reminds me of how great you were, and I was at the time, and the era, he'd say. Then in 2021, news broke of Manson's alleged mistreatment of several high-profile women over the years. Manson would end up losing his recording contract and be dropped by his manager. And Reznor would weigh in on the controversy in the news, putting out a statement that says, I have been vocal over the years about my dislike of Manson as a person and cut ties with him nearly 25 years ago. Reznor also took time to slam Manson's 1998 autobiography, which described a story where Manson and Reznor allegedly mistreated an inebriated woman. Reznor would go on to write, As I said at the time, the passage from Manson's memoir is a complete fabrication. I was infuriated and offended back then when it came out and remain so today. The passage in question was allegedly part of an unpublished 1995 interview with the now defunct Empyrean magazine. The story was removed from the interview because the editors had concerns over unethical procedures that were used to get information from Manson. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.